Hello, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. I'm Chris Goodman with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History's Lunch Program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we are streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube, and those videos are available to watch anytime after the live stream. If you have not already done so, please silence your cell phones. Do you have artifacts that tell a family story or illuminate a piece of Mississippi history? If so, on Saturday, March 11th, Archives and History staff will teach you how to conserve those documents, photographs, and other artifacts at our Community Curation Day. The event is free, but contact the State Archives to reserve your spot. And then beginning at noon tomorrow here in this space, um, the Mississippi Historical Society will hold its annual meeting. Um, there are fabulous uh, panels planned for it, and there is still time for you to register if you have not done so. Finally, I hope you'll come back next Wednesday for History's Lunch when Katie Burnett and Monica Miller will discuss their new LSU press book, The Tacky South. Today, I'm delighted to welcome back Martin Zwiers as he presents Raceland, The Ecology of Segregation. Martin Zwiers is Senior Lecturer of Contemporary History and American Studies at the University of Groningen, the Netherlands, and is a visiting fellow with the Center for the Study of Southern Culture at the University of Mississippi and the New Orleans Center for the Gulf South at Tulane University. He is author of the book Senator James Eastland, Mississippi's Jim Crow Democrat, and co-editor of Profiles in Power, Personality, Persona, and the U.S. President. So he has earned his PhD in history from the University of Groningen, an MA in Southern Studies from the University of Mississippi, an MA in American Studies, and a third MA in the history of political culture, both from the University of Groningen. Help me welcome Martin Zwiers. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chris, for your kind introduction. And thank you all for coming to listen to my talk. It's always a pleasure to be in Jackson. Um, did a history's lunch talk eight years ago when the Eastman book came out, and uh, now I'm back in town to talk about this new project I'm working on called Raceland, uh, the Ecology of Segregation. So, um, what I want to talk about today, um, here's the agenda for my presentation. Um, first, uh, yeah, sort of explain a little bit about how I sort of conceived this, this project, um, this Raceland project. And then I'll talk about a couple of case studies uh, that are central to the project. Um, it's built around five case studies. I will discuss three of them. Um, so the first one is about uh, the Second World War and the rebuilding of Germany and Europe with the Marshall Plan. Uh, the second case study is about oil drilling in the Gulf of Mexico and the sugar trade in the Caribbean during the 1950s. And then uh, the third case study is about pesticides and agricultural trade between the United States and Europe in the 1960s, uh, which will be about Jamie Witten. And I'll be at the conference too, and on Friday I'll be doing a paper on Witten. So um, uh, I won't sort of dwell too much on Witten today. Uh, if you want to hear more about him, come to my paper, uh, to my presentation on Friday morning at 9 a.m. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I'd love to hear your suggestions if you have some, or and also questions. Um, but let me just start off with uh, what I have been doing in my previous research, um, which was about Senator James Eastland, a uh, Democrat from Mississippi. And um, this was my PhD project, and eventually I re rewrote it and turned it into a manuscript and then got published by uh, Louisiana State University Press in 2015. Um, uh, this was really sort of a national history and um, about political developments in the post-World War II South. And what I was interested in was sort of the way these Southern Democrats managed to stay in power. Um, you know, um, the historiography back then was still very much dominated by the question, you know, how did Southern Republicans get power here in the South, the rise of Southern Republicans? And I was more interested in sort of the tenacity of these Southern Democrats, Democrats like Eastland, uh, especially in the period after World War II when the Democratic Party sort of moved more towards civil rights, um, but you still had sort of this cohort of very conservative segregationist Democrats um, uh, who were part of the National Democratic Party. And Eastland 
Um, he retired in 1978, so that's, that's fairly late. Um, his colleagues like John Stannis, also Jimmy Witten, who lasted much longer, were able to sort of uh, adapt themselves to the changing times. Eastland had a little bit more trouble doing that, but still managed to uh, uh, keep his seat up until 1978. Um, so that's what the, this book is about. Um, I used Eastland's career to study the ways that um, segregationist Democrats from the South and the leadership of the National Democratic Party sort of figured out a way to, you know, benefit from the votes still coming out of the South, because right, it meant majorities in the Senate, these 22 senators um, from the solid Democratic South. Um, but Eastland and his colleagues also needed this sort of affiliation with the National Democratic Party to uh, stay in power, to be effective, because the whole system seniority was, of course, based on, um, uh, on party membership. Um, Another, uh, yeah, Mississippi story I wrote uh, was in, uh, in 2016. Uh, this is about William Winter and his early career in the 1950s and the 1960s when he labeled himself as a Eastland Stannis Democrat. And I was sort of interested in the, yeah, this political persona that he created and that he sort of tried to navigate his way within this, um, you know, the 50s, of course, the, uh, the days of massive resistance, uh, the 1960s when after the Voting Rights Act, uh, the black vote became more important. Um, and also sort of this tension again between the Stennis approach to segregation, which was what historians call pragmatic segregation, and then you've got Eastland uh, and his uh, sort of camp within, uh, within the state. And that was more sort of the massive resistance, very sort of radical kind of um, pro-segregationist uh, rhetoric and, and politics. At the same time, these two camps work together. So that's sort of what, what I argued in that um, article. So these sort of, um, yeah, uh, you can download that article, by the way, for free if you go to my website, if you're interested. But um, it appeared in the Southern Quarterly. And um, uh, yeah, so, but this was still very much sort of within this national framework, yeah, um, looking at it from the state perspective, looking at it from, you know, US politics. And what I want to do with this new project I'm working on with, with Raceland, um, this is more what you call a transnational history or a global history. Um, so it's, again, about the Jim Crow system, um, but I'm very much interested in with this project in sort of the global entanglements of, um, yeah, agents of Jim Crow. And with agents, I mean like politicians, but also businessmen, um, uh, you know, social leaders. And it's sort of a big group of people who believed in segregation and who, you know, were trying to perpetuate the system and trying to find alliances, not just within the US, but also abroad. Um, so that's a global aspect, sort of looking at these yeah, um, alliances, transnational alliances that white supremacists from the South tried to build. Um, and on the other hand, it's also about the environment, so the environmental impact of the Jim Crow system. Um, it's sort of based on the premise that, you know, when you are, you know, you have this system that is quite toxic from a social perspective, it might also be quite toxic when you look at it from an environmental point of view. So that's sort of the two things that I'm trying to connect here. Um, it's sort of came out of this new historiography. So historiography, that's sort of, you know, literature that appears about a specific subject. Um, and there's a lot of sort of new, well, new is now about 10 years old, so it's not that new anymore, coming out uh, about the subject of, of slavery. And some names are here, Matt, Matthew Pratchett Terrell, uh, Sven Beckett and Walter Johnson, and they wrote books about the system of slavery, um, so the antebellum period, but they look at it from a, a global perspective. Yeah? Um, Walter Johnson also looks at the Mississippi Valley during that period of time as sort of a, a Silicon Valley. This was the place where a lot of innovation happened yeah, on these plantations when it came to sort of you know, maximizing the profits you get out of labor, uh, mechanization, those kind of things. And he also looks at the global connections between the plantations along the Mississippi River and then, you know, what's happening in England and Liverpool at the places where they sold the cotton and how sort of the prices of cotton in England connected to sort of the punishment that enslaved people received on the plantation because if the quality wasn't good enough, then, you know, uh, enslaved workers had to work harder. Um, so that's sort of this idea of, yeah, um, the, the important role of, of slavery in the development of American capitalism in the market revolution, um, the global connections between the Deep South and the rest of the world. Um, 
and, and also this idea that slavery, that um, yeah, plantation owners didn't think of it as an old system. They thought of it, you know, thinking about, you know, how can we perpetuate the system and sort of as a system that should last into the future, right? Um, and that sort of made me rethink also uh, how people who believe in Jim Crow thought of it, you know, how can we, you know, make the system last here in the South and how can we, you know, look for allies abroad? Yeah, so I tried to use that model that these historians about slavery developed and then apply it to the uh, period of Jim Crow and especially the period after the Second World War. Uh, it was also influenced by recent political developments um, with the Trump administration. Um, there was lots of, you know, um, racial tensions, yeah, with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, the discussion about Confederate monuments, and at the same time, you also had many environmental issues at that time, um, and that with Trump administration you know, trying to reduce the uh, power of, of the Environmental Protection Agency, for instance. Yeah, so that also made me think, you know, how are these things interconnected, racial issues with environmental issues. So that's sort of the, yeah, the uh, how I got to this uh, this project. It's uh, uh, It's been a long time in the making. I already submitted a, a sort of a grant application back in 2011, so, and now finally, the European Commission, thank you, Europe, <laughs> has uh, uh, decided to fund this with a three-year fellowship, so I'm really happy about that. And um, Raceland, it's actually a real town in Louisiana. I didn't know that, <laughs> but I was Googling it, and then this picture popped up, and it's made in the 1970s. I think it's through the EPA um, that they sort of try to uh, document uh, environmental issues in the United States. And this is, uh, Raceland is sort of in this area where the big sugar plantations are in, in Louisiana. And you see here uh, this big pile of sugar cane, processed sugar cane. And uh, yeah, and I use it a lot also sort of as uh, the opening page of my website. If you're interested, you can find more information about this project on racelandproject.com. Um, all right. so. Um, yeah, it's, uh, mm, it's also a, 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 a research about foreign politics, and I'm very interested in sort of the racial aspects of foreign politics. Uh, some people study it from an economic point of view, or you can study it you know, through you know, um, power relations, but I just uh, look at racial issues and how they determine certain decision-making processes within foreign policy. And um, Stephanie Rolf, who is a professor here in Jackson at Millsaps uh, College, she wrote a, a great book about the Citizens Council, and um, and she uses this concept of a global ecosystem of white supremacy, and I find that a very useful metaphor because when you think about ecosystems, it's um, yeah you know all organisms within a specific area. Um, here it's a global ecosystem, so it's sort of this planetary view that she develops. And ecosystems, of course, um, function through symbiosis, so through working together, but there's also, you know, parasitic relations, right? So I like this whole idea about, you know, the global and then the environmental that come together within this metaphor of the global ecosystem of white supremacy. So historians have been studying um, the Jim Crow system within a sort of transnational or global context, not as much as historians of the civil rights movement, because there's a really strong connection already that historians see between the civil rights movement here in the U.S. South and um, uh, you know back in the 50s, 60s, but also sort of the decolonization movement that started in that period, and that these two movements are very much interconnected because it's both they were fighting against white supremacy and white domination, right? Um, uh, but seg uh, historians of, of segregation have done that, but to a, a lesser degree, I would, I would argue, and often they look more at apartheid regimes in Africa. So Rhodesia under Ian Smith, that's Ian Smith right there, shooting at hopefully something, not somebody, um, and, uh, um, and South Africa, right? Um, both countries had this system that was similar to Jim Crow segregation in the South, um, and uh, also, these Jim Crow politicians, they love to travel to South Africa and to Rhodesia and look at, you know, how they did things there. Uh, Eastland, for instance, went to Rhodesia, in, I think, in the late 60s or early 70s, 
And then he's standing there in a the cotton field, and he's saying, wow, it's, it's like I'm back home in the Mississippi Delta. Um, so he, um, he saw similarities right there. And there's a strong support actually coming out of the white south for these uh, regimes. Um, they've got this great collection at, at the University of Mississippi um, by an agent from the Rhodesian government who was trying to you know, get diplomatic support from the US government. They had an office up in Washington. And um, uh, I mean, the federal government wasn't going to do it, um, but congressmen from the South and senators were very much in support of the, um, of the Ian Smith regime. Um, OK, so um, this focus on Africa, because there are similarities um, that are more obvious, maybe. Um, but I want to look at um, not just you know what was going on in Africa, but also sort of take the rest of the world into account and how Jim Crow um, politicians um, you know tried to find alliances outside of Africa and also went to Europe, uh, the Caribbean, and also Asia. Yeah, so it's really sort of a more hopefully inclusive history of, of the history of uh, uh, of Jim Crow. So that's what I want to talk about today, a couple of these case studies. Um, and I will start with uh, the first one, and that's uh, the reconstruction of Europe uh, after the Second World War. Uh, yeah, this is the city of Dresden in Germany. Uh, it was firebombed uh, and uh, pretty much destroyed. And, and the big question was, of course, after the war, the Germans were defeated. Um, what are we going to do with this continent? That's what the Allies had to think about. Of course, especially the United States, um, who's um, you know had uh, invested uh, a lot in the war effort, uh, liberated Europe, uh, and then you have of course the problem of the Soviet Union, one of the allies in the Second World War, but quickly you know turns into uh, an enemy. And um, yeah, so the and it's 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 kind of I find it fascinating the role that Southern politicians played in the drafting of this sort of the. Uh, the plans to reconstruct Europe, to reconstruct Germany, and also in the drafting of the Marshall Plan. I'll get to that uh, in a minute. Um, many uh, southerner, southern politicians who were in Congress joined committees that traveled to Europe after the war, and they sort of tried to figure out, you know, what's going on, um, how should we uh, deal with this problem, and um, and and they saw sort of a connection there between what happened to Europe during the war. Uh, and after the war, and what had happened to the U.S. South, to the Confederacy during the Civil War, and uh, and what happened afterwards during Reconstruction. So that was sort of in the back of their minds. You know, we need to sort of avoid a similar Reconstruction of Europe as we had in the South. Um, there were different ideas about what are we going to do with Europe, and specifically Germany. One of them was drafted by Henry Morgenthau, who was in the Roosevelt administration. And his idea was, you know, we need to demilitarize Germany. We need to take away you know, the, the big factories, the heavy industry, so they will never be able to start a war again. We're going to turn Germany into a pastoral state with farms, and that's it. Um, and so that was one idea, to sort of um, yeah, take away the economic power of Germany. What you see is there's a lot of opposition to this idea, again, also coming out of the wide south, uh, because they thought that you know if you have Germany weakened and you've got the Russians moving in from the east, then you know the rest of Europe might fall to communism, right? So we need Germany as a strong state with a strong industry, a strong economy, as sort of a buffer against the communists that are rolling in from uh, from Russia. Um, and the way they frame it, it's it's um, to a certain extent very much racialized. Yeah, uh, they talk about. Germany as sort of the yeah the, the 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 cradle of Western civilization of Western white civilization, and uh, that civilization is two thousand years old. And then you've got this atheist and they say Oriental communism moving in from the east, right? So there's sort of these ye yellow peril tropes that they try to enable here and to mobilize people to um, to uh, to rebuild Germany into a strong state. Um, it also helps them, you know, to link communism to, yeah, sort of as an oriental ideology, because within the United States, the civil rights movement is often linked with communism, right? And, you know, when you call something un-American, 
that helps in you know presenting yourself as being very American. Yeah, so they put that label of un-Americanism on communism, and then inside the United States, they also link it to civil rights activism, and so this fifth column being under control of the Kremlin. Um, it's kind of, I mean, Marx and Engels were not Oriental, I would say, because they were from Germany, so I'm not sure how that works, but yeah, um, that's the frame that, uh, that they use. Um, Eastland, for instance, he said um, uh, that communist rule was the first time in, Christ in the Christian era that the doctrine of slavery uh, has been adopted as applied to the white, white race. So we also sort of connects it to, uh, to the issue of slavery and how white people were being enslaved by, uh, uh, by communists. Um, so that's sort of the framing that they use. Um, let's talk a bit about uh, the Marshall Plan. I find this, uh, this image, yeah, it's, uh, it's, so this is the harbor of Bremen, and these, this is cotton coming out of, uh, out of the United States. And um, I mean, it might be cotton out of California, it might also be cotton out of, out of Mississippi, right? And um, when you think about that story I just told, that Walter Johnson is making this link between Liverpool and then the plantations in the South during the antebellum era, yeah, and this cotton um, might have been produced on a plantation in Mississippi, right, in the 1940s. You still have the sharecropping system, you still have the Jim Crow system, and um, so the origins of this cotton and who picked it, uh, where does it come from. Um, it's, uh, it's fascinating to see how important the sort of the, the South again is in, in the drafting of the, of the Marshall Plan and also the support that Southern planters gave to the Marshall Plan. Um, there was sort of a idea, of course, cotton being an export product, that you need strong markets, overseas markets, to sell your, your goods, and especially cotton, to, uh, to, uh, to bring to Europe. So Southern planters were very much in favor of uh, the rebuilding of Europe, making it into a strong market, free market economy, yeah, so it should be capitalist and protected again against the, uh, against the communists. Um, the federal government understands that. Uh, the Under Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, he travels to, uh, to Mississippi in, uh, in 1947 to sort of figure out how the plantation block is responding to this plan that S Secretary Marshall is developing uh, with regard to, uh, to uh, uh, the European Recovery Plan. Yeah, that's the official name for the Marshall Plan. So he goes to, uh, to the Delta in, uh, in May 1947 and he delivers a speech at Delta State, what, what's now known as Delta State University, for the Delta Council, yeah, so this organization of, of big planters. Um, he talks about freedom, he talks about democratic institutions. Um, he also talks about sort of uh, humanitarian aspects and also about economic aspects, right? And, um, and the audience there is very enthusiastic about it. Um, yeah, they understand that if you, you know, in, in the 1940s, 1950s, freedom and democratic government, yeah, that meant something specific in, in Mississippi, right? And a large group of people was excluded from uh, participating in, in democracy. So this rings a bell for them because they don't see it as really a threat to the Jim Crow system. Um, later on in the 1950s, uh, the Delta, of course, became a hotbed of massive resistance. The first citizens' councils originated uh, in the Delta, in Yanola, Mississippi, as a important uh, place, um, but it's also the place where sort of the Marshall Plan had sort of, you know, the trial balloon was sort of put up into the air there uh, by Dean Acheson. And then uh, about a year later, the European Recovery Program is enacted with the backing of these Jim Crow Democrats. Yeah. So think about it in sort of economic terms, uh, how the plantation economy is profiting from a strong Europe. Um, also how, you know, this anti-communism has sort of this racialized, um, yeah, connotation, I would say, um, as an oriental ideology, but also how pro-segregationist leaders link it to the civil rights movement. Okay, so that's the, the f oh wait, no, not yet, we've got something else. Um, this is also part of the first gay study, um, because it also connects to this idea of bloodstreams and ethnicity. Uh, this is about the displaced persons legislation, which was drafted uh, after the Second World War. President Truman wanted a new uh, refugee law. There's lots of people were displaced uh, after the Second World War, lost their homes. Uh, people were on a move uh, in Europe, yeah, sort of similar to maybe what's happening today, maybe today as a, 
Now that's a bigger scale, but there's lots of displaced workers too now, of course, uh, with the Ukraine war. Similar problems um, after the Second World War. And um, so Truman asked Congress to draft uh, a new displaced persons legislation. And when you start the rhetoric um, of, um, again, Jim Crow politicians, they racialized this, this law. Uh, and they, they think about it in ethnic terms. Uh, and they have a preference for certain groups of people coming into the country. And, um, and there's sort of this anti-Semitic element in it um, uh, because they believe that you, know, you need to sort of have a, a similar ethnic background to understand American institutions, US uh, democratic institutions. So uh, Germanic folks are okay because there's a link between Germanic people and the Anglo-Saxons, white people of the South. Uh, but African American folks and, and Jewish people, they are being sort of, you know, left out. And um, we should, you know, make sure that not too many Jewish people especially should come into the country. Uh, this was all under the chairmanship of uh, Pat McCarran. He was a senator from Nevada. He was a chair of the Judiciary Committee. He actually wanted to ship all the refugees out to Alaska. That was his solution. Um, that didn't happen. But still, um, this restricted idea of displaced persons legislation is very much on the minds of uh, Jim Crow politicians. Um, this has been turned into an article. Um, it's called Jim Crow Democracy, the U.S. South and Racialized Policy Making in the Aftermath of World War II. And uh, it's open access, so you can uh, download it on, um, uh, on the website of the, of the journal. It came out um, four years ago. So, okay, that was the first case study. That was uh, sort of about the plantation economy and cotton. Um, let's move on to the second one, which is about oil and sugar. So then we move from Europe down into uh, the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, you see here, this image is from the uh, Dixie Pratt Convention in 1948 in Birmingham, the year that um, a, a group of Southern Democrats sort of seceded from the National Democratic Party and formed their own uh, organization, uh, the States' Rights uh, Democrats. And there's been plenty of uh, literature about this movement. Um, Terry Fredrickson wrote, wrote a great book about it, uh, about the Dixie Pratt revol Revolt and the end of the Salt South. Um, again, uh, here is, is the focus on their segregationist beliefs. And that was one part of the Dixie Pratt program, but there was another part, uh, and that was about oil, and that's often not as much emphasized. Um, because um, what the Dixie Pratt also wanted to do was that the states, so state sovereignty uh, when it comes to oil fields, right? So states like Louisiana, Mississippi to a certain extent, Texas also, uh, that they should have the control over oil that was located in the so-called tidelands, which is sort of offshore areas uh, where they wanted to drill for oil and then use the revenue to sort of, you know, keep the money for themselves. Um, and many oil tycoons actually were involved in a Dixie Pratt movement. H.L. Uh, Hunt is a famous example, right? Um, from Texas. And what they wanted to do, um, they wanted to use these oil revenues as a way to maintain segregation. Uh, this was already sort of thinking about the future, you know, uh, what might happen if the federal government eventually decides to, you know, desegregate, for instance, our schools. How are we going to keep our schools then uh, in a segregated, uh, uh, well, in a way, sort of, you know, uh, the threat was, of course, that separate but equal, but black schools, of course, weren't equal. So they thought, you know, if we can use this money coming out of these oil fields, we can sort of try to increase the quality of, of the black schools and in that way prevent uh, desegregation. And um, yeah, if you look at the, the way these two things were interconnected, it's uh, very much there. This is a speech by uh, the State Attorney General, Jack uh, Grimion uh, uh, of Louisiana. He uh, delivers a speech in, um, uh, in September 1958 to the New Orleans Citizens Council. And it's a speech about the Thailand. So he's talking about these oil fields and he's, he's saying, you know, we are going to Washington on a regular basis and we appear in court there before congressional committees and, and we try to convince them that these oil fields belong to the states, their state sovereignty, their states' rights. Then he just immediately moves on to the issue of segregation. And these things for him are, you know, two sides of the same coin. He's saying, you know, we need, to, we need, we need these oil fields also to finance our segregated system. 
And um, yeah, he calls it, you know, it's, it's the state's deep-rooted social customs and traditions. Um, and, you know, desegregation could bring about radical changes in education, employment, and other vital fields of activity. So here is this, this interlinking between the defense of segregation on the one hand by state officials coming from the south, and then um, the idea that states should own these tidelands. And here uh, it's, it's pretty clear um, how they thought that this money might be useful. Uh, this is from the Louisiana Joint Legislative Committee, uh, which was a committee set up in the 50s to, to protect uh, segregation. And they see money coming out of the Thailand as, quote, a heaven sent opportunity to finance current school building needs over a 10 year period without additional taxation. So we're not going to increase taxes and thereby place the school districts in such position and their local needs could thereafter be met from local resources. So that's these oil fields, right? Um, so that's pretty obvious connection here uh, between the issue of education, segregated education and um, uh, and state control over oil. An important uh, player in this whole discussion is uh, Leander Perez. He was a good friend of James Eastland. They had sort of this fascination for cattle, like cows, and, and so they corresponded about that a lot. Um, also, both of them are very interested in, in oil fields, and, and for Perez, this was maybe a, even a more pressing issue. Um, and a, a better opportunity so to, to fund his politics. He was a district attorney of uh, Plaquemine Parish in, in Louisiana, which is all the way south of New Orleans. Um, it's more water than land, I think, especially right now with all the land disappearing there. Um, and he was really sort of this, this segregationist strong man, uh, very outspoken in his defense of segregation. Um, and he ruled his parish as sort of this, yeah, almost like a dictator. Um, and, um, and he became very rich. Um, um, let's see, in 1983, it was discovered that 80 million in oil royalties had been paid to Delta Development Company, which he secretly owned. So he made a lot of money out of this, these oil fields. And, and the oil companies really liked to make deals with these local leaders. It was easy for companies like Shell and Texaco to, you know, just go to Leander, uh, make a deal, and start drilling instead of going through you know, the federal government through that entire bureaucratic machine there. Um, so that it was mutually beneficial to um, these segregationist leaders like Perez. They could fund their social system, but also build their personal wealth through this oil money. And these big multinational oil companies, they benefited from a much easier process to get licenses to start drilling in, in the Thailand. Right. Um, and when you think about the environmental impact of oil drilling um, and I mean, talking about sort of, you know, fossil fuels and, and, and uh, uh, climate change, here we see what is happening in, in Louisiana um, in the past and uh, right now. It's uh, th the red area is land loss um, projected between, um, I think, 1932 and, uh, and 2050. So actual land loss and uh, what is going to happen uh, in the future. And you can see here that if, if we have plaquemine sort of, you know, down here, uh, just yeah, here. Well, that's just, it's gonna be water, basically. Uh, uh, and yeah, there's a connection here between um, this oil drilling, of course, and, uh, and, and, and what's going on in Louisiana. These oil companies started sort of digging canals in the wetlands uh, to, to put the pipes in, uh, which also causes these natural barriers to disappear. Yeah? So there's a lot of environmental uh, destruction, environmental loss um, through oil drilling. And then think about sort of racial aspects to it, right? Um, that the money that's coming out of these oil fields being used by people like Perez to, uh, to keep segregation alive. Um, yeah. So that's one part of the, uh, the Caribbean case study, I could say. The other one is about sugar and segregation. Uh, again, sort of the, the way I started thinking about this was through this book by Matthew Patrick Terrell. It's called American Mediterranean Southern Slaveholders in the Age of Emancipation, uh, which is a, a great book, I think. Um, and what uh, Terrell is doing in that book, he's looking at um, uh, slaveholder planters 
um, and how they thought of themselves not just as citizens of the United States, but also part of this broader sort of circumcaribbean um, yeah, fraternity or community of fellow plantation owners in the Caribbean, um, Cuba, around uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And, uh, and there's a strong connection, of course, between Cuba and the South. Uh, people from the Deep South, from New Orleans, would travel to Havana, and they saw sort of uh, a lot of connections there and a lot of similarities with them. And, um, and sort of I, I wanted to apply that idea also, what was going on in the 1950s with regard to these strongman regimes in Cuba and the Dominican Republic. And sort of how that connects these geopolitical motives to, uh, to the Schubert trade. And then, uh, so we move on to, here we see Richard Nixon with uh, Rafael Trujillo, who is the, the dictator of the Dominican Republic, a very ruthless, brutal uh, leader. But he was also an ally of the United States. And this comes out of the, uh, of course, the Cold War again. This Cold War context is important. It's very strongly anti-communist, and, and the U.S. thinks, okay, that's what we need, right, to, uh, to keep communism out of the out of the Caribbean. By the end of the 1950s, there's a change within the federal government. Eisenhower administration, um, Trujillo starts to do a lot of crazy things. Um, he's trying to assassinate his opponents, uh, Betancourt in Venezuela. And at that point, um, uh, the US government understands this is not good public relations within, you know, uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean. So we need to sort of find a way to um, to reframe our alliance with, uh, with Trujillo. And they tried to take away sort of some of the uh, privileges that he had. And again, there's a strong opposition coming out of the uh, Jim Crow South. They believe that Trujillo is actually a, a very good leader. Um, and I sort of argue that this is based on this idea of anti-communism, but there's also racial aspects, um, uh, sort of the way that uh, race is working in the Dominican Republic, the relation between Haiti and the Dominican Republic, yeah, they share the same island, uh, and also the uh, similar economic situation, yeah, the sugar plantations of the Dominican Republic and then the sugar plantations in, uh, especially in Louisiana. Um, and, um, and again, it, it's sort of interesting to see how, um, how uh, politicians, in this case from Louisiana, talk about uh, the Dominican Republic. This is a, a Representative George Long, Democrat from Louisiana, of course, part of this long dynasty that they have there in, uh, uh, in, in Louisiana. Um, he talks about uh, the Trujillo's country as a, yeah, a sort of a, a barrier against communism, atheistic communism again. He's, he's having a debate between, um, uh, with uh, Charles Porter, who is a, a congressman from Oregon, which is, of course, all the way up in the north. And, and he's telling Porter, you know, if I want to know stuff about Canada, I'll ask you because you're way closer to the Canadian provinces. If you want to know something about the Caribbean, then you come to me because we sort of are part, you know, we, we belong to the same community here. Louisiana, Dominican Republic, we understand what's going on uh, within our borders. Yeah, and that's sort of that last quote that um, Oregon is, you know, way up there, 3,000 miles from the Dominican Republic, while it's very close to Louisiana, and it means much more to us of Louisiana than it does to those other great states of our union. Uh, here we see Trujillo, I like to dress in very um, extravagant uniforms. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, um, th this, this plantation product becomes very important in sort of the, the way that the, the relationship, relationship develops between the United States and the Dominican Republic. Uh, after Cuba becomes um, Castro, <laughs> when Castro takes over uh, in 1959, um, there's an embargo and then there's a debate about, you know, what are we gonna do with the, the sugar that Cuba had, this sugar allocation. And again, it's um, um, Southern Democrats particularly that argue, you know, we need to give it to, to Trujillo because he's our friend and we should help him. Um, stay in power, and and they travel through the uh, the Caribbean, and again here it's th the way they talk about Haiti, which is of course a um, country that that was born out of slavery, fought a war of independence against the French and slavers uh, and, and uh, colonial power, um, and here it's again sort of this idea of civilization that they use. Yeah, Haiti is uncivilized, 
Um, and the Dominican Republic, this dictatorship, you know, that's where order exists. And, uh, and that's uh, a country that's well organized. And it's again about sort of what Elder is saying in 58, it's the type of leadership, right? That Haiti has no leadership. And um, so there's sort of this uh, admiration for authoritarian politics, like leaders like uh, Trujillo. So when we think about, uh, yeah, maybe uh, Jim Crow states during this period, they're part of the US. At the same time, they're also part of this, these strongman regimes in the Greater Caribbean, I would argue. Um, so these police states uh, that exist, right? Um, there's a lot of personalism going on in, in states like Alabama and, uh, and Mississippi. You've got your political machines, I already mentioned uh, the Eastern uh, machine. Um, there is this proclivity to authoritarian politics and also the role of race and the role of the plantation economy. Um, so there's a lot of similarities, I would say, between uh, countries like Cuba and the Batista and the Dominican Republic on Trujillo and then uh, Alabama, you know, here under George Wallace. Uh, okay, and then the final case study, we've got about four minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go, so this is what I will be talking about on Friday morning, so I'm going to go through it quickly and, um, and, and come see me on, on Friday morning again because then uh, I'll be more, talk more in depth about what Rachel Carson did to, um, uh, to DDT and, and pesticides and, um, and the application of these chemicals on, on, on the plantations uh, in the Deep South. Um, Silent Spring had a major impact on how you know, people around the world think about the um, yeah the role of pesticides, the impact stuff like DDT has on on the environment, but it was especially um, uh, on the plantations, uh, the planter block that was sort of yeah uh, they didn't really like what Rachel Carson was doing uh, because uh, cotton requires a lot of insecticides, herbicides, fertilizer to make it grow. Yeah, um, you need to kill the boll weevil, and um, and by the 1960s, cotton was the most insecticide intensive crop. Yeah, it used 40% of all insecticides within uh, uh, the United States. So Carson, what she was arguing is really a threat to the way that plantations were producing uh, at that time. Yeah, sort of this uh, very, um, yeah, uh, enormous amounts of pesticides being sprayed on the cotton fields. I was talking to Curtis Wilkie, um, before Christmas, and he lived in Clarksdale in, uh, in, in the early 1960s, and he talked about malathion, and sort of this is one of the, these products that was applied to the fields, and he was like, this is all, we, all these clouds that we were living in during the summer of, of pesticides, and he was like, I'm, I'm happy that my kids didn't grow like three heads, <laughs> and so, uh, um, yeah, so this is, a, it's a threat to the way of production, plantation production that was happening at that point, and Witten is a, a sort of the spokesman for the planter block, um, he tries to, uh, yeah, basically um, stop the work that Carson is doing, and he writes his own book, uh, That We May Live. And, uh, and he also goes on sort of a, a tour of Europe to convince people there that pesticides are safe. And he, he delivers a speech in 1967, for instance, in Vienna, where he um, is talking about um, a fish kill in the Mississippi River, and then that fish in this lake in Sunflower County, they are super healthy, although they've got 40% of 40 times more pesticides in their body than these fish that all died in the, in the Mississippi River, right? Um, it's an interesting speech. And also thinking about, you know, the role Witten had in the 1950s as uh, uh, sort of this uh, Jim Crow politician, right? Very much outspoken against civil rights. Um, uh, so uh, that happens in 1967. What I also find interesting is the role of uh, a Dutch company. Well, formerly Dutch company because they moved away from the Netherlands. Uh, they're now in England. But Royal Dutch Shell sponsored Witten in writing That We May Live. Uh, also sponsored a translation of, uh, of the book, Para Que Podemos Vivir. Another chemical company, Geige, uh, from I think it's Austria or Germany, uh, sponsored a German edition of Witten's book titled Damit wir leben können. So this book is being translated in uh, at least two different languages. He also tries to get it translated into Japanese. Uh, one of his friends is, uh, is, is trying to, uh, to uh, make that happen, uh, Don Lurch. But these German and Spanish translations, uh, they became available. And um, uh, yeah, so and this is the global reach here of, of Witten's politics when it comes to, uh, to agrochemicals. 
Um, yeah, I mean, thinking about, about Shell, uh, also as sort of this global company, um, their role in, in Louisiana with the oil drilling um, there, um, also the impact this company has in Mississippi with the development of pesticides, it's also a large met a petrochemical company. And then what's happening in the Dutch Caribbean on Curaçao, um, they had a big refinery there and um, especially the, the local uh, majority black population, um, their working conditions really sort of uh, deteriorate in the late 1960s, being fired and rehired through um, sort of these hiring companies for way lower wages and this, this big protest then emerges in 1969, yet a year that this translation of Witten's book comes out. It's called Printa di Mai, uh, the thir 30th of May, and it's sort of this popular uprising against the politics of Shell and also of the Dutch colonial government. You see here, uh, these look like cute Dutch buildings, um, but it's the, the capital of, of Curaçao, uh, Willemstad, and uh, so they march from the refinery to, uh, to the, uh, the, the offices of the Dutch colonial government here, right? And again, thinking about this in global terms, yeah, the role that Shell has in, um, um, in Louisiana with the oil drilling, the petrochemical production, yeah, between Baton Rouge and, um, uh, and, and New Orleans, and how that then connects to the plantation economy upriver uh, in the Delta, and how that then, you know, again, went in as a representative of that plantation regime going to Europe and talking to people there, and then uh, getting his work translated in all these different languages so other people in other parts of the planet can also read um, about the wonders of chemicals. I'm just gonna skip this. There's two other case studies. Um, this one I've been working on lately, the Ten Ton Waterway and the Panama Canal in the 1970s. Very interesting, maybe for another presentation. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, yeah, so this is uh, just a little summary of what I've been doing lately, um, some partner institutions. The research is mainly archival, but I'm also doing interviews with, um, we've been doing some interviews with, with black farmers, with a friend of mine who's a journalist, uh, Lila Frank, to also think about counter-plantation projects. So um, I was very interested in, in the Freedom Farm um, cooperation that started by Fannie Lou Hamer. And what we've been doing in January is sort of looking at the legacy of Fannie Lou Hamer when it comes to um, yeah, thinking about different ways of doing agriculture and also about black land ownership and uh, output. It's scholarly work. Um, again, try to make as much open access as possible. Uh, it's investigative journalism, so it's uh, also working with some uh, newspapers and um, uh, magazines, not just here in the States, but also in the Netherlands, so people can also learn about uh, the US there and also social media, because um, besides the website, there's also an Instagram account. So if you want to follow me there, please do so. Okay, thank you very much. It's a lot, <laughs> but <laughs> now we're ready for questions. And oh, Chris has a question. I think we have a few minutes for questions. If anyone has a question, raise your hand or bring the mic to you. Come on up. The governor of Florida. Mm -hmm. Ron DeSantis. Finds, I was not going to use mm -hmm. the name. <laughs> My apologies. Finds no value in black people. Mm -hmm. I remember your slide, Segregation Tidelands, and there's a comment at the lower right that segregation is not affected by economics. Lower right. Mm -hmm. Segregation is not directly concerned with revenue. Yeah. How do white people persist in the belief that they got to where they are absent of any Africans? Mm -hmm. Capitalism, democracy, America, the U.S. South was created out of the subjugation and oppression of black people, primarily from Africa. Mm -hmm. Please tell me, why do white people not make that connection? Mm, I think that sort of, um, you have to maybe go back to the, to the origins of slavery here in the United States that, you know, it's as soon as it turns into a racial system and a syst systemic system, right? Um, it's, it, it functions for the dehumanization of, of black people, I think, and that, you know, you can exploit them and um, it, it 
and um, you can treat them as, as animals. I've, not, I've just been reading this book by Richard uh, uh, Grant about, about Natchez and the deepest house of all, how sort of the, how, you know, Natchez was the town with the highest number of millionaires and the idea that you build this wealth yourself, well, it's coming off the expectation of other people. But in order to, to make that switch in your head, I think you need to dehumanize the people that you're benefiting from, right? Um, and, and that's, and sort of the, that this history has of, of course been forgotten and, and the idea that how slavery has been, sort of the how the old South has been portrayed also, right? As sort of this wonderful period and there was a organic community on the plantation and, and the planters took good care of his enslaved workers and uh, yeah, sort of this mythology that's been built around it and that we now are, you know, finally coming to terms with the fact that this system was horrible and that these plantations were not, you know, places where you should have weddings, but that these were forced labor camps, um, uh, that we're now trying to come to terms with it, um, that is causing a lot of friction, I think, because this whole belief system is now starting to tumble down and that sort of is a, yeah. And, and also the idea that, you know, what, what are we gonna, how are we gonna repay all this debt that we are owing them, right? Uh, so that's, uh, that's another thing. Um, but yeah, you're, you're totally right that the development of capitalism, not just in this country, global capitalism, the, the Dutch were very much involved in, in, in bringing people from Africa to, to, the, to, to the Americas, right? So it's a global system. And it's the same thing that's going on now in the Netherlands. Uh, Black Lives Matter also is, is very active in the Netherlands. And yeah, yeah. and there's this, mm, you know, you've, you've got this cultural archive that's been building for 400 years. Um, with the idea that everything is coming through, you know, the hard work of, of white people, which is, I mean, true to, I mean, it's not that white people don't work hard, but then this whole history of where this wealth is coming from and is built on is largely being forgotten. And that is necessary, I think, to, to keep this idea of meritocracy in our head. Okay, that's a big, <laughs> but oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Hello, uh, I'm Hi. curious to see if you uh, have run into or if you're Research goes into Cancer Alley, modern mm -hmm. day Cancer Alley between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Yeah, um, yeah, I've been doing some research on that too. Uh, it's um, mm, yeah, so I've I've been uh, trying to think about the connections between uh, the plantation economy and then the petrochemical industry in Louisiana, and that these two, you know, these economic areas are very much interconnected because everything that's being produced in plants in Louisiana is used on the plantations. It starts with fuel, right, to, to for the machines in the 1930s with mechanization, and then after the Second World War with pesticides and herbicides. Fertilizer, like these ammonia synthesis plants that they have in, in Cancer Alley, very important for the, for the plantation uh, uh, economy, of course, um, and also other big farms uh, across the country. Um, and it's, I, I find it, you know, it's where these factories are located, it's on these old plantation grounds along the Mississippi River, right? Um, and so there's a connection here between the plantation past, I would say, and then these companies, and also when you think about the way labor is organized in, in, uh, in these companies and the effects that they have on local communities like Norco, Geismar, um, people are being uh, bought out of their, uh, you know, that they have to sell their houses because it's not safe there. And instead of so that these petrochemical companies solve the problem, it's their solution is, you know, you need to leave and, you know, sort of, again, relocation here going on. And uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, uh, that's something uh, yeah, I've been studying. So, yeah. uh, so this is fascinating, so I'm Thank glad you. to hear it. Um, what I've started thinking about when I listened to it and I wondered whether you had explored it is the connection between the religious justifications for slavery and the religious justifications for the, the capture of what I will call, for the sake of the question, uncivilized lands. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you have these small European nations that needed to commoditize land and people mm -hmm. um, and had different religious conceptions of what they were doing that made apply to the people they were colonizing and to the land. Mm -hmm. But then you talked about sort of 
like the, the earlier period, right? Sort of the, with the 16th, 17th century, that, that time. Yeah, it carries, definitely, yeah. Well, um, so first, the sort of the justification for slavery was built on religion, right? That it's different, people with different religions that are not Christian, you are allowed to enslave, and then it quickly starts turning towards skin color. But this religious aspect always is, is important, right? This idea of civilization and... Um, uh, you're going to ask uh -huh. what I started thinking about is the William Blake hymn of was Jerusalem built in England which no it wasn't but um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll just clearly be historical here but there's a kind of notion that civilized land mm -hmm. is land you need to protect and uncivilized land occupied by uncivilized people is land that you don't need to protect mm -hmm. that might carry through a lot of this discussion. Yeah, definitely. And also land that you should actually occupy to civilize people there through Christianity, right? Um, and uh, yeah, it's also what, um, when I was showing sort of this, the slide about how they thought about communism, it's what was being emphasized is sort of the atheistic, atheistic aspect of it, right? It is ungodly ideology and uh, and what the United States stands for, that's democracy and free markets and Christianity. So these things are then very much connected with each other. And then the white South sort of portraying themselves as the you know most American region of all um, because it, it's about local government. It's the Christian region, right? Um, so they use this also to sort of, uh, to, to portray themselves as a, um, yeah, as sort of the, the heartland of, of, of American freedoms in that sense. Which is, yeah, difficult <laughs> if you think about the Jim Crow system. Now, that's a, actually the antithesis of, I would say, of, of democracy and freedom. We have a question from the live stream. How did Southern Democrats frame the, quote, failure of Reconstruction in the U.S. after the Civil War? What lesson did they think needed learning as the Marshall Plan was being developed? Excellent question. Uh, yeah, it's um, sort of the... What they did, so they made a connection here between the federal troops that were stationed in the South and so this military occupation and the threat of military occupation by the communists, right? So here it's this connection that they make between, on the one hand, you know, the Yankees that invade the South and put the, the, the white South on the military rule for like uh, 12 years. And that might again also happen when we don't help Europe rebuild into a capitalist society. The Russians will move in, they will sort of benefit from the poverty that very much exists in Europe at that point, um, and they will put Europe then on the military rule. So the Union troops are then being replaced by uh, the communists. Other questions? I'll ask one. Um, a conversation that happens in the state mm -hmm. is sort of comparing and contrasting Stennis and Eastland with regard to their racial attitudes and legal actions that they took with regard to race. And I wonder if you would maybe say a few words. I know you're going to talk more about Jamie Whitten tomorrow, but Friday, maybe sort Friday, of, Friday. yeah, maybe, maybe <laughs> sort of consider him in, in that trio. Okay. Um, yeah, well, you, so with Stennis and Eastland, um, I, I started that article with um, all these sort of sites that are still named after John Stennis. I think you still have, I'm, I'm not sure if that still exists, uh, the NASA Center, the State Center, and all that. Um, Eastland doesn't have anything named after him anymore. Um, he had the law library at, at the University of Mississippi and uh, that federal building over there, um, I don't know what the name of that street is, but um, downtown, that also got removed. Um, and that's because Eastland was very much, sort of, you know, he was too too radical in his, in his segregationist beliefs. Well, Stennis, um, th they had the same sort of white supremacist ideology, they, they fought for the same system, but Stennis had a sort of maybe better idea of how to talk about that, and he talked about it in constitutional terms, while Eastland was always very much sort of talking about it in racial terms, right? And that sort of, sort of affects also your legacy. I think Jamie Whitten is more like a Stennis kind of politician in that sense. Um, in the 1950s, he, you know, he, t he talks about segregation very openly. Uh, it's, it's an, that, you know, it's, it's important that we keep it. And that's also understandable if you want to be a white politician coming out of the South, that you need to have that uh, ideology. But he's very much outspoken about it. Um, but then by the 
end of the 1960s, early 1970s, he manages to sort of yeah, reframe himself and reinvent himself as sort of a more pragmatic politician. And yeah, what he's known for is that he brings all these federal dollars back to, to the state, right? And, uh, and Tennessee Some Baby Waterways is one example of it. Um, not sure if it is doing the thing it's supposed to do, but it, it, the idea that he had, you know, I'm, I'm bringing money back to the state and that's a way, you know, I, I think to, you know, let's forget about what happened. Things change, I change, and let's move on. So he, he belongs more, I think, in that Stennis camp. And Stennis, of course, stayed in, in the Senate up until the 1980s. Um, yeah. Okay. We, we have come to the top of another hour. Um, we have copies of Martin's fine biography of Senator Eastland for sale over here. Um, I hope that you will come to the Historical Society annual meeting tomorrow and Friday here in this space. I hope that you'll come back next week when we'll have the editors of the Tacky South book for History is Lunch. For now, help me thank Martin Zwiers for this fantastic program today. <laughs> <laughs>